Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. And I got to thinking, I haven't really done a good video on the tides yet. So now's as good a time as any. Let's cue up the music and learn about tides. This is a map of tidal amplitude, which is the difference between the low and the high tide in a given place. So what that means is that the low tide might be uh, a meter below sea level and the high tide might be a meter above sea level and that would be a tidal amplitude of two meters which is considered very high and those high tidal amplitudes are here in red. So this is where the difference between the low tide and the high tide is the greatest. Okay so let's go ahead and do a basic explanation of what causes tides. And the answer, of course, is the gravitational pull of the moon and the sun. The other thing that I'm going to just take out of this equation is going to be the, uh, the force of gravitational acceleration. That's uniform throughout this entire Earth. And it really doesn't add anything to this discussion of tides. So let's go ahead and take it from this. Now, if you look at this system from outside uh, in space out here, and just a detached look at it, you will see that there's a certain amount of gravitational force from the center of the Earth towards the Moon. If you look at the side of the Earth nearest the Moon on this same line, the gravitational force from that spot towards the Moon will be a little bit larger because it is closer to the Moon. If you compare it to the center of the Earth and make this your frame of reference, there's a little bit more force pulling on the Earth from out here than there is here. Now, the land will bulge up slightly underneath that in response to that increased acceleration, but more importantly, the water will bulge up towards the Moon. Now, let's have a look over at this spot right here on the far side of the Earth, but again, in line with the center of the Moon and the center of the Earth. Notice that there's a certain amount of force right here, and I had that just arbitrarily done as half an inch. And out here, I've got an amount of force that's about a quarter of an inch. So it's less here than it is here. As a result, what happens to this water that is out here above this spot on the Earth? By inertia, it wants to stay at a steady acceleration. So it's going to actually lag behind the acceleration from the center of the Earth. And as a result, we're going to get a little bulge of water out here as the water just kind of lags behind because this is accelerating more than this is accelerating here. And in this frame of reference from the center of the Earth, it's almost as if there's an acceleration going in the opposite direction. That's why we get this little bulge from this, this tidal force. However, that's not the main reason that we have this bulge on the Earth. So let's take a look at this spot right up here, okay? Now, this will have approximately a little bit less, but approximately the same attraction to the Moon as the center of the Earth does. But it's going to actually be directed towards the Moon. So it's actually directed downward a little bit. Likewise, on this side of the Earth, the direction of the force is going to be, again, towards the Moon, but it'll be angled slightly upward. It won't be directly straight out. Now, when you're dealing with a vector, such as this one down here, where we've got a vector going towards the moon along this coordinate system that we've set up at the center of the Earth, we're actually going to have a component of that vector that's going to go towards the moon, and we're going to have a component of that vector that goes upward like that. So, if you look at the water above these spots, they're going to have a, comp a vector that goes down towards the center of the Earth. 
like that. And as you work your way around the side, you will continue to have vectors going downward, like so. Plus, there's also going to be vectors going in this direction, like that. The end result is water is going to be moved in this direction and in this direction up towards this bulge. And that bulge is going to get larger. Now let's look on the other side of the Earth. Say we have a spot right here. Like so. These spots are going to have vectors of attraction that are pointed towards the center of the moon. And like on the opposite side, each of these little vectors will have a downward vector going towards this center of Earth, the center of moon line. Uh, once again, the result will be water will be moved downward from the poles towards the equator, and this bulge will increase. So let's think about what this means for the tides. The tides will be largest over these bulges, and as we recall, they're directly under the moon between 29 north and 29 south latitude. And the water and the tides will be smallest up at the poles. And that's exactly what we see on the map. And I've put a link to a PBS special on this in the description in case you need some further clarification. If you were to look at the contributions of the moon and the sun towards the tides, the moon is about two-thirds, and the sun, even though it's much more massive, is a lot further away, so it's only got about a third of the total effect on the tides. Now there are two types of tides that deserve special mention. When the sun and the moon are in alignment with the earth, we get what's called spring tides. The solar tide and the lunar tide are additive to each other, and we get really big tides. When the sun, the earth, and the moon are at 90 degrees to each other, the solar tide and the lunar tide are both trying to pull that bulge of water in two different directions, and we get relatively small tides, and those are called neap tides. Now, for extra credit, tell me what's wrong with this illustration. Put your answer in the comments. Now that we understand the tides, let's see how they move across the surface of the Earth, and an Earth that has land and continents on it. Now again, looking at this from the North Pole, the Earth will rotate in that direction. That will cause the moon to appear to rotate from a person sitting here on Earth in that direction. Now, if we start from a zero rotation, we can imagine that the moon is here, center of the Earth is out here. This is the bulge of the high tide, and, and there's another one on that side. Now, as six hours go by, this person will now be up here because it takes six hours to go one quarter of the way around the circumference. However, this bulge of water was sitting over that person, remember? And now that bulge of water has to be down here it has to essentially travel along the surface of the Earth one quarter of the distance. That will take time to do. And as a result, the tide will lag about two hours behind where the moon is directly over the Earth. So basically, you can imagine that the moon kind of drags the water behind it as the Earth rotates underneath it. 
Now, if you look up amphidromic points in Wiki, you will see that they are the center of rotation of tides due to currents coming, coming into contact with each other and setting up a whirlpool type effect, which may extend over hundreds of square miles. And they are due to the topography of the bottom of the ocean, ocean currents, and in some cases, land masses as they go through. We'll see that in a minute. But let's look at these guys out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean first. Imagine, if you would, a large area where two currents that are at opposing directions come into contact with each other. Those currents will begin to rotate as they pass, very much like um, a whirlpool would occur where you have two opposing currents coming into contact in a river. There are two things that make these currents rotate. One is the Coriolis effect due to the rotation of the Earth. The other is the strength of the currents, which is determined by temperature, salinity, and topography of the ocean floor. All other factors being equal, they will rotate counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere and clockwise in the southern hemisphere. However, you may get a situation where the currents are strong enough to overcome the Coriolis effect and make them rotate in the opposite direction. If you look at a rotating mass of water, what happens to the center of that mass? It dips down a little bit and becomes very stable. You can, you can simulate this by just stirring a pot of soup on the stove. The center of the, of the whirlpool will dip down and not move very much as centrifugal force causes the water to creep up the sides of the pot in response to the rotating motion. Now, simply because the center is relatively stable and low to begin with, you're not seeing much in the line of a tidal fluctuation at the center of that rotation, such as the Hawaiian Islands. And of course, from our discussion of how the tidal bulges are formed by the moon on the Earth, that water came from the poles. So it would follow that at the polar regions, tides would be very, very, very shallow because most of the action is occurring down between 29 degrees north and 29 degrees south under the path of the moon. Now, if you look at the actual wiki page on these tidal nodes, it talks about them being present in the polar seas. Now, where else does it suggest that they'll be present? How about in shallow landlocked seas, such as the Mediterranean and the Black Sea. And here we see the Mediterranean has several of them. But one thing I want to draw your attention to, have a look at that bay down there with the red in it. Why would a bay have such high tides in an area that's got relatively low tides? Now, this is an interesting illustration that he's using. As the tides go around the British Isles, they're constricted through the English Channel. So you have a huge volume of water coming up against the landmass of the British Isles, and it's being squeezed through this very narrow English Channel. It would follow that as it came out the other end, there may be some eddies and swirling, just like you would see um, uh, water go around a rock in a brook. You'll see swirling as it reaches the far side of that rock. That's what tidal nodes come from, is this rotating current. So this actually confirms what we're talking about here. Now, if you look a little closer over here between, say, Ireland and the British Isles out here, you'll see that those sea passages are relatively short compared to the length of the British Isles, and you're not getting a whole lot of flow through that area. So you'll have tides in here, of course, but you're not going to have the eddy currents that you see over here in southeast England. To give you an idea of how this works, let's go ahead and have a look at this video of people surfing a tidal bore in the United Kingdom. Notice that when you look at this, you'll see that it's not a solid wall of water coming through. There are eddies, especially as it gets up by the shore and as it makes turns around bends in the river. This is very analogous to what happens when the tidal, bore, the tidal bore or the tides come through the English Channel and form a tidal node on the southeast corner of the island. Now, I want you to pay special attention to the southern tip of South America and the Drake Passage between South America and the Antarctic Peninsula. Notice how high tide goes right through there and swirls around? 
Then low tide goes right through there and swirls around, followed by high tide again. You see how the eddy formation occurs on the southeast coast of South America? Now look at the land masses in there. Notice how it kind of hooks from the north down to the southeast and traps all of that tidal surge in there. So that's an ideal place for an eddy. Why don't you go down to a stream and put, put a piece of wood in the, in the stream and see what happens around the tip of the wood on the downstream side. That's what you're seeing in South America. And finally, let's have a look at the actual Bay of Fundy. There it is. Notice as the tide comes up the mouth of the bay, it goes off into those, those two arms down there and is just funneled right in. It absolutely follows that you would have enormous tides at the end of that bay. And that's what we see. Well, guys, understanding the tides completely requires a couple of semesters of oceanography and then a lifetime of study. So in a 15-minute video, I think I gave you some of the basics. Uh, if you're further interested, uh, there's NOAA. There's a number of other websites that you can go to to get more detailed information. Or audit a course. Listen to a TED Talk about it. This is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Make sure you hit that little like and subscribe button down there. I'd like to get some more subscribers for this channel. And also, we have a Patreon and a website in case you want to have a look at those. We'll see you again soon, and thank you for stopping by.